Okay, so we're going to Okay, so we're going to be in chapter 23. Now, chapter 23 marks the beginning of a new time period. The new time period which we're discussing is right there. I've got uh, Europe 1750 through 1914. Remember, we have just wrapped up the time period 1450 to 1750. So why change? Why do we consider this a change in time periods? Well, there are going to be a couple of major things. We've had some of our previous major empires uh, declining or ending. The Mughal are on their way out. Ottomans are weakening, but they're not gone. Safavid's gone. Uh, Russia's still around. Uh, Europe is beginning, has begun its establishment of those maritime uh, empires and that will only pick up. It's also a time of revolution and we're going to look at that in Europe here and in the West, in the United States. We'll look at the time that it's a revolution. We also um, are getting ready to begin one of the major events that delineate this time period from any other and that is the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution kicks off here after 1750 and really gets things rolling. So let's go ahead. Let's look at some of the major ideas in this chapter, the West between 1750 and 1914. All right, what I've got underlined is what I want you to write down. Um, you don't have to write all of it down. There were four, number one, there were major, so the, some of the major themes are political upheaval. It's an age of revolution. I've got the years 1775 through 1848. Um, mostly because it's an age of revolution in the West anyway, uh, because we'll start with 1775 because that's the American Revolution and end at least in Europe in 1848 because that will be the last of the big social rebellions. Um, after that, and we're going to look at this later on, things change and Europe settles down. You won't see the massive protests you've seen before. Um, B, under major themes, exportation of Western European institutions to settler societies. What do I mean by that? I mean, you see people in the Americas, in the United States anyway, or the Amer North American colonies start to copy the British forms of government. You'll see copies of Parliament with the House of Burgesses here in Virginia. Uh, you'll see they begin to act and pass laws and try to set up their governments like the Europeans do. It can also be considered an age of revolution because this will also be the time period for independence movements in Latin America. Number two, major changes. Monarchies are replaced by parliaments. That happens pretty much all over Europe. Up through 1750, we had talked a lot about absolute monarchs. Remember absolute monarchs? What are those? Yep. They're the kings who claim they rule by divine right, and they had complete and total power. Um, North America merges as a major force in world economics. Now, that really doesn't get kicked off, really doesn't get kicked off until the late 1800s in the United States, because there's a major event in the U.S. that will push us to industrialize. We're already on our way, but that major event beginning in 1861 is... The Civil War, the U.S. Civil War, that will be what kicks us off. There are also going to be a series of disruptions. There will be new cultural forms, um, some challenge, some important, some support enlightened thought. We'll read about those. We'll have things like evolution. There will be a new scientific idea that's going to pop up. and uh, You're going to see new governments, new states, such as Germany will appear in the late 1800s, United States in the late 1700s. Italy will appear in the late eight, mid to late 1800s. Um, you get a number of new countries appear, which will lead to new alliances. And we'll look at those right before we go into war, the Great War. We call it the Great War uh, at this point because we don't, that's the European name. And also, you don't call it World War I until after World War II. And number four, phases of Western transformation. We're going to look at three major phases here. Uh, first off, 1750 to 1775, this is a period of growing crisis. Um, from 1775 through 1850 is our political revolution. Uh, a notice it goes simultaneously with the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution is going to bring a lot of beautiful, beneficial things, but also it's going to upset people and going to cause a great deal of 
angst among the working class. And then 1850 through 1914 for the West will be what will be the implications of the Industrial Revolution. In other words, what will we see out of the Industrial Revolution? What will it be its impact upon the family? What will be its impact upon society, upon the ways in which people live, um, their views, their education? It's going to have a major role. So that's a big part of what's going on here. All right. Uh, the age of revolution, what kind of, what were some of the forces of change? What are some of the things that are pushing us towards revolution? Okay, first off, we've got cultural change. There's the change in intellectual thought. Enlightenment has played a big role. You've heard me say this again and again and again. Political thought has challenged the old ways of government. It's challenged the old ways of doing things. For instance, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau said government should be based on the general will of the people. In other words, it's not the king who decides who gets to be in charge, but it's the people. It, government should be to help the people, not to put a certain guy in charge like a king and leave him in charge. That's just, just wrong. Um, there is a gap between leaders and thinkers. Uh, leaders are the aristocrats and the kings. And they don't like some of these Enlightenment ideas because it challenges their position. If I claim divine right, then I, I get to rule no matter what. I can do a lousy job and it doesn't matter because God gave me the right to rule. Enlightenment says, oh, no, it, you know, it doesn't work that way, buddy. In that, it works this way. It works that we are, you, you as the government are here to help us. And if you don't, then we have trouble. It also encouraged economic and social change. The Industrial Revolution really encourages change. We'll look more at that later on. Uh, new business people challenge the old aristocracy. We all know that aristocracy means rich. We also sometimes forget that it generally implies property owners, landowners, and so they are going to get challenged. Um, so it's going to be a new power structure uh, versus the old, versus the economic and then we're going to have population revolution. That's going to be big. Now, this population revolution, uh, what was the impact of it? Uh, it really has a couple of different impacts. First off, the upper class needed to control their position. They feel threatened by all these. Um, the upper class feel threatened is what you're supposed to underline in there. The upper class feel threatened because there are all these new people. They're, they're doing things other than um, just raising uh, agriculture. They're engaging in the Industrial Revolution. And so that's a threat. Number two, some of the, many of these people can't inherit property. Population's gone up so much that they, if you divide your farm up among all your boys and do that over a couple generations, you're going to see that pretty quickly you don't have any land left to give away. So therefore, and that's what this symbol here means, therefore they join the working class. There is a rapid expansion of domestic manufacturing. What do I mean by domestic manufacturing? That's that proto-industrialization. Your book calls it the putting out system. You see it there on the slide, the putting out system, capitalism out of your house. Um, in other words, the mer would bring by the cloth or, or whatever that you were going to work with and then you would sew it and create it in your home and then they would come back and collect the finished product later on. Um, it did number four, it altered behaviors. One, we get a consumer mentality. That means keeping up with the Joneses. In case you've never heard that expression before, keeping up with the Joneses simply means that I want to, if my neighbors have a lot of stuff, I want it too. I want to have a lot of stuff too. B, um, there's an increase in premarital sex. Um, people are waiting longer to get married, and when they wait longer to get married, they don't necessarily want to wait longer to have sex. So there's some of that. And then C, parents lose control. Um, you can't threaten your children anymore with loss of inheritance because well, they know they're not going to get anything anyway. It used to be in the old days you could say, if you misbehave, if you don't listen to your father, when I die, I'm going to write you out of the will. Well, now your, your younger children know they're not going to get anything. It's the only the older ones who get anything. So it's, it creates a certain angst 
there, certain difficulty there. Okay. Okay. One of the first of the major revolutions is the American Revolution. And what type of government was set up by the American Revolution? Well, first off, it incorporated Enlightenment ideas. You remember that. Um, the very opening of the Declaration of Independence, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Happiness, is a paraphrase of the John Locke uh, quote, Life, Liberty, and Property. Uh, Montesquieu, one of the Enlightenment ideas, um, checks and balances, divided br branches of government. And that means like the judiciary, uh, legislative, and executive branches. We also have things like civil liberties. That's the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. But the Founding Fathers did keep that thing called slavery. And also we see an extension of voting rights. Um, more and more white property males are getting the right to vote. That is something that is growing out there. All right. Now the next big revolution is this French Revolution. French Revolution, now this will totally throw Europe into uh, quite a tizzy, and it'll even impact Latin America. You're going to learn about that later on. What were some of the causes of the French Revolution? Well, you had ideological factors. Ideological, just what the word looks like, it's based on your ideas. Um, enlightenment pressure, uh, they wanted to limit the power of the church and the aristocracy. I'm going to talk a little bit about it in class, but we're going to look at the three branches uh, or three estates in the French, excuse me, political system. We'll talk about those. There are social changes, such as the merchants wanting more power. Um, number three, peasants are pressed by population issues, and they wanted freedom from the aristocracy. They wanted to be able to tell the aristocracy, we're not listening to you anymore. So they want that. And a fourth, the catalyst were economic problems brought on by the French government. Uh, there were a series of wars, one of which was the uh, Seven Years' War and the supporting of the American Revolution, both of which cost France a great deal of money. And would uh, we've said this again and again, wars are expensive, and they've got to pay for these wars. And so they raise taxes. Another thing is this Versailles. Versailles, you remember, was built by Louis XIV and was the incredibly fancy palace place that he had. And it will be very expensive to keep him living in this style of life. So, um, French Revolution erupts. You're going to have a reading on that. We're going to we'll have a little reading on the French Revolution. But the French Revolution goes through three phases. First off is the moderate phase. And I've got up here, despite the name for the aristocrats and the royal family, these all seem pretty radical. The French Revolution actually maintains maintains the royal family, just greatly reduces their power and and uh, makes some radical changes. Uh, they, what happens though is other European kings around see what around France, see what's going on in France, and it scares the heck out of them. And so what they want to do is they want to stop it. So they launch attacks against the French. Um, and in order to save the revolution, the radicals take over. Now some of the radicals, and it does appear there are some basis for this, blame some of the aristocrats for siding, supporting these other countries. Now imagine how this goes over. These rich guys, think about this guys, these rich guys are saying, are saying to other countries, come in and help take over our country because we want to save our position. Now, if you're a Frenchman, a commoner, and you find out that these rich guys are helping the Germans or the Austrians or the Spanish try to take your country over, you're angry. And it'll usher in the radical phase, which we're going to look at. And the third phase will be the authoritarian phase, which we're going to look at. All right. Um, oh, I've got a picture of a guillotine here because this is part of this radical phase. Uh, one of the things they do when they take over in the radical phase is they decide that some of these aristocrats and the king need to be executed so they won't cause us any more problems. And that ushers in the age of the guillotine. All right, what were some of the changes to come out of the radical phase? Um, they proclaimed universal manhood suffrage. 
Wow. Now, notice it's manhood, not womanhood. That's a shame. But manhood suffrage, that's a big deal. Actually, that should be underlined. I don't know why it's not. Something's happened. It's moved uh, things. Um, they've uh, Manhood suffrage used to be it was only, well, heck, in France, no males could vote. And in the Americas, it was only property males. Now all free males can vote. Uh, they will institute uh, universal weights and measures. I put in there would never that will never catch on. Well, yeah, it does catch on. Um, it's actually known as the metric system. It's based on the number ten. They say you know this old system we use of dozens and stuff like that. It's sort of silly. Um, let's come up with something that's better. They abolish slavery, and then number four they do something that while it might not seem big to us. It is big to them, and it will have a huge impact on France, and that's universal, meaning everybody. Military conscription. That means every male must join and serve in the army. Now, what is the outcome of that? France now has a huge army, in fact, the biggest in Europe, and a motivated army. See, what's happened is they're all... Frenchmen now, all French men now share the common experience of having served in the army, served in the military, and this makes them extremely loyal to the government. And when that that will catch on, you'll see later on that a Napoleon in the authoritarian phase, the third phase, will uh, really use that to his advantage. So all this, but this makes the rest of Europe nervous. They see what's going on in France. They see radical ideas, kings and aristocrats being beheaded. Over here, see the guillotine here with the guy holding the head? Oh, it scares the heck out of them. Okay? Um, so this ushers in the French Revolution, enters the radical, and now we're in the authoritarian phase. And what are some of the impacts? Napoleon comes in. The problem with the radical phase is it can't last. It's too it's too much. It's too much. I mean, they actually outlaw the church during this phase. Um, it's just, it's too far out there. People can't, can't accept it. And so Robespierre, who's the guy who leads the uh, radical phase, will actually himself eventually find his head chopped off. Uh, you would think Napoleon, being a general, would come in and be like, okay, we're going all the way back to the way everything was. We're, we're going all the way back. No more. No more. But he actually maintains a lot of the old ideas of the French Revolution. Number one, he keeps the system of schools, secondary schools and universities. He's a big supporter of public education. The radicals in the French Revolution believe everybody should have an opportunity for an education, not just the rich. Number two, he keeps the concept of a meritocracy. You guys will remember we did it in a quiz earlier this semester. Meritocracy is a system based upon merit. That's right. What are your achievements on your skills? Not your birth, but what's your skills? Number three, religious freedom. Um, says, well, we're not going to, the church is not going to be able to tell you what to do. You can worship whatever you want. And the church, now this does not apply to the United States, but the church w was the, subject to taxes. Um, they had to pay taxes. In fact, during the radical phase, they even tried to do away with the church. Um, and then he tried to conquer Europe. He will make it. He will be very successful. He'll cover most of Europe, um, do really, really well. But he gets stopped eventually in Russia. He'll get stopped in Russia. Russia will be, what will happen is he'll, tr he'll think he can make it to Russia and get to Moscow before winter sets in. And he actually does a pretty good job of it. He gets close to Moscow. But Russia essentially practice harasses him and drops back. Harass, drop back. Harass, drop back. He gets stuck in mud. He gets stuck in the early winter rains and snows in Russia. And it's rough. But he makes it to Moscow. So what do the people of Moscow do? They give him Moscow. But before they do, they decide to burn the city and burn any food in it. Make sure there's nothing for him to eat. And he has to return, return to France with this army. Now, this is an army. Think of it this way, guys. Listen to these numbers. He leaves France and attacks Russia with an army of 500,000 men. 
he returns to France with an army smaller than 50,000 men. He lost over 450,000 men, either to death on the battlefield, starvation, disease, freezing, or in some cases, desertion. So he returns from Russia a defeated man. You're going to see that comes back to bite a couple of other generals as well. All right, so um, what's the reaction against uh, this? After France is finally defeated and Napoleon finally defeated in 1815, what do they do? Well, they get together and they call together something called the Congress of Vienna. Congress of Vienna. What does the Congress of Vienna try to do? Um, Congress of Vienna, uh, I don't know why. Hang on a second. I'm going to pause it for just. Okay, I'm back. I just stopped and changed the underlining there for us. Um, they tried to create, number one, a balance of power. That means they don't want to do away with France, but they want to create strong countries around France. The concept here under balance of power is no one is so powerful that they can defeat everybody else. Nor is anybody so weak they look like a potential target for anybody else. So if everybody's about the same, nobody's going to go to war because no one will gain anything. It's going to be a stalemate. Number two, they tried to restore the old days of conservative monarchies, kings. But liberals push for political change. They want more voting rights. The radicals, they wanted universal suffrage. That would mean for men, women, not just landed people, but everybody. There's also in Europe socialism, which Karl Marx, and we're going to look at him in a little bit, is a big part of. And they're going to attack private property. Um, then we're going to have um, revolutions from students and urban artisans. They have the most to gain under this new system. And But the bottom line is by the 1830s, much of Western Europe has solid parliaments. In other words, there's at least some, some representative forms of government with these guys. Okay, industrialization in the revolution of 1848. Um, why did the revolutions of 1848 fail? These are basically worker revolutions in cities. Workers um, get angry and get upset and respond within the cities. Number one, revolution is just too drastic. For most people, revolution is these guys are too radical for them. They know there needs to be change, but there's just too much. It's too much change. Um, number two, we need better transportation to reduce food crises. Um, used to be, the thing that always kicks off these revolutions is people starving. You, it's obvious. If you're starving, you're going to get angry. Um, but now with trains and transportation, we can move food to the, from where we've got extra food to the cities so people aren't starving, and that calms things down. Also, the police have better riot control than they used to. Last two slides, and then we're going to stop this part one. Adjustments to industrial life. A couple of major adjustments happen. First off, family life changes. What do I mean? We lower birth rates because death rates go down. People stop having so many kids because now all their kids are making it, or most of their kids are making it to adulthood. As such, children become more important. When I have a fewer children, I can dote over them. I can make a big fuss over them. Also, they're no longer a source of income, so I don't want as many children. Used to be living on the farm, my kids help do work and help provide income for the family. Not so much anymore. Not so much. Better health for kids. Uh, only 10% are dying before the 10 years old. Hey, that's a big reduction. It used to be 40 to 50%. So that. Louis Pasteur discovers germs, which leads to better sanitation and health. Louis Pasteur figures out about germs, and if we wash our hands, we're healthier. Number two, we get a consumer culture begins. People have more money to buy products. Uh, we're living above the subsistence level. Um, we're used to be subsistence means I had just enough to survive, just enough to get by. Now I have enough that I can have an extra couple sets of clothes. I don't have to wash them, you know, have two or three sets of clothes to last me all week. But I can have a Sunday best and I can have other things. More money to buy these products. Number three, um, there's a rise in corporations. 
more companies are now stock owned. Uh, labor unions are created in response to bad working conditions and low wages. Uh, workers bargain for this better pay and conditions. Workers have been working long, six, you know, sometimes 12 to 16 hour days, getting paid little or nothing, and they get tired of it and they decide to band together. Now initially, initially labor unions are outlawed by governments. But eventually, governments realize that without labor unions, they're going to face a real revolution, especially after 1848. So they decide to um, expand and start to allow some of those. Also, farm life improves. Uh, they start to band together to create cooperatives to market crops and purchase supplies. Um, in fact, we have a farm cooperative right here in Winchester. Um, I don't know if you're going out to the hospital, if you've ever seen southern states. That's one of those. The idea was these little farmers would band together and they'd have bigger bargaining power against the large corporations who bought their farm products. So also work can be done cheaper if they can do it all together. All right, that stop brings us through part one. Um, please watch part two as well. And I know part one was long, but I appreciate your attention. Thank you.